This lecture is part of an online mathematics course on group theory and will mainly be about Cauchy's theorem in group theory. So to motivate it, we've classified all groups of order at most nine so far. So let's try and classify groups of order 10, which is two times five, or more generally groups of order 2p for p prime. Um, now it would be very useful in classifying these groups to know that there's an element of order p and an element of order 2 in the group. Um, fortunately, this is given by Cauchy's theorem, which says that if p is prime divides the order of a group G, then G has an element of order P. This only works if P is prime. So for example, if G is equal to Z modulo 2Z times Z modulo 2Z, then G has order four. So four divides the order of G but G has no element of order four, because they're all of order two or one. So this is a sort of partial converse of, of part of Lagrange's theorem. Lagrange's theorem says that if a number divides the order of a group, then, sorry, it says that if G is an element of a group, then its order divides the order of the group. Conversely, you can ask if a number divides the order of a group, does the group have an element of that order? In general, the answer is no, but Cauchy's theorem says that this is true if, if the number is, is a prime. And we're going to give two proofs of Cauchy's theorem. One is a sort of general purpose method of proving things in group theory, and the other is a kind of... Um, slick proof that uses a clever idea. Um, so first of all, so we want to prove, so suppose P prime divides the order of G. And we want to show that there is an element of order P. So we assume this result is true for all smaller um, groups. So when I say assume the result, I mean um, we want to prove G has an element of order P. So what we're going to do is to assume that this that if P divides the order of any smaller group, then G has an element of that order. And um, by induction, this will be enough to prove the result is true for all groups. So first of all, assume, let's first do the case where G is abelian. Um, well, we pick G, um, G and G of some prime order Q. If Q equals P, we're done. Um, if not, we look at G modulo, um, the group generated by G. Now, since G is abelian, all subgroups are normal, so this is a perfectly good group. And this is order less than G. So by induction, we can find some H in G over little g. You notice this is order divisible by G. Sorry, it is order divisible by P because this is order divisible by P and this has order co-prime to P. So um, where H is order 
uh, P. Now, let, let's lift H to some element um, A in G. So we're finding some element in the group big G whose image is H. And then A has order the multiple of P because its image in this group here has, has order P. In fact, you can easily see that A has order either P or P times Q. If it is order P, we're done. If it is order P times Q, then A to the Q has order P. So in either case, we found an element of G of order P. So that does the case when G is abelian. Well, um, what about if G is not abelian? So suppose G is not abelian, or not necessarily abelian. I mean, we don't really mind if it happens to be abelian. Well, um, every proper subgroup, so we can assume every proper subgroup has order co prime to P. So proper subgroup means um, a subgroup not equal to G itself. So this this just says that this has is less than strictly less than G. And that's because if some proper subgroup had was had order divisible by P, then we could pick an element of order P in that subgroup by induction and we're done. So we, we can assume that every proper subgroup is order co prime to P. So every subgroup every proper subgroup every subgroup not equal to g has index divisible by p because the index of a subgroup is just the order of g divided by the order of the subgroup the order of g is divisible by p and the order of the subgroup isn't and now let's look at this equation here let's look at all elements of g and we know this is equal to the size of the center plus the sum over all conjugacy classes of size greater than one of the size of the conjugacy class. So this is just exactly the same formula we had last lecture. You remember we're looking at the action of G on itself by conjugation and looking at the orbits. And the orbits either have size one, in which case they're in the center, or they have size greater than one, in which case they are some conjugacy class of size greater than one. And now the size of each conjugacy class is equal to the order of G divided by the order of um, the subgroup fixing some element. So, so this, this, is, this, is, this fixes some element of the conjugacy class. And we notice that G S is definitely less, is, 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 has order less than G because we're assuming the conjugacy class has size greater than one. So now we see this is divisible by P because we assume the order of G is divisible by P. And these terms here are all divisible by P because we said that every subgroup has index divisible by P. So that follows from this fact here. Well, if this term is divisible by P and this term is divisible by P, we see that the center of G is divisible by P. Well, the center of G is abelian. I mean, the elements of the center commute with everything in G, so they certainly commute with each other. Um, so the center of G is an abelian group whose order is divisible by P. So by the previous sheet of paper where we proved this result for G abelian, 
the center of G has an element of order P. So we've proved our theorem that every group, um, finite group of order divisible by P has an element of order exactly P. Um, this is a fairly typical example of how you prove things in finite group theory. If you've got some result, you assume it's true for all smaller groups, and you sort of nibble away at your group, trying to um, trying to reduce it to a smaller group where we can apply induction. For instance, we first nibble away by doing the abelian case, and then we nibble a bit further by showing that, 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 that if that, that either there's a smaller subgroup we can of order divisible by P we can use, or we can find an, an abelian subgroup of G of order divisible by P. So that's the first proof of Cauchy's theorem. There's actually a, um, a slick proof of it, um, where all you do is you look at the um, solutions of this equation. So this is a second proof of Cauchy's theorem. So we ask how many solutions are there to this following equation, g1, g2 up to gp is equal to 1. Let's count the number of solutions. Well, the number of solutions is obviously the order of g to the p minus 1, because we can choose g1 up to g p minus 1 to be anything, and then there's a unique solution for, for the pth term. And we notice this is divisible by p, because we assume the order of g is divisible by p. And um, now, if we've got any solution a, b, c up to x, say, if this is equal to 1, then x, a, b, c up to, what's the number before x, w is equal to 1. And similarly, w, x, a, b, c up to that is equal to 1. Because this um, expression here is just, we, we, we just multiply by x on the left and x inverse on the right. And if we do that to 1, we just get 1. So what we see is all the solutions of this form into groups of p solutions. Unless all, um, all the, the, these terms a, b, c, and so on are the same. If they're all the same, we only get one solution. Notice we have to assume p is prime here. For instance, if we assumed if, if, if p was, say, 4, then we would get the term a, b, a, b. And if we permuted this, we would get B, A, B, A. And if we cited it again, we'd just get A, B, A, B again and B, A, B, A again. So we wouldn't actually get a group of four solutions to this. We'd only get a group of two of them because um, when, we had, when we'd got through two of these, we'd get back to where we start. And that, that depends on the fact that four is not prime. So if we go through, if, if, if we just cycle this two times, we get back to where we started. So we're assuming P is prime in order to show that the number of solutions like this is divisible by P. So we find G to the P minus 1 is something divisible by P. Plus the number of solutions of G to the P equals 1. And now we see this is divisible by P. And this is also divisible by P because it, 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 it's, it's a collection of um, groups of P um, um, solutions, all of which are kind of cycles, cyclic permutations of each other. So, so this is divisible by P. So we see that for any finite group, so if P prime divides G, 
then the number of solutions of g to the p equals 1 is a multiple of p. Well, there's one solution, which is just to take g equals 1, and all others have order p. So the number of elements of order p is congruent to minus 1 mod p. That means it's a multiple of p plus minus 1. Um, and furthermore, in fact, you can do a little bit more than this because um, each element of order p, if g is of order p, it generates a group of order p. And this group contains p minus 1 elements of order p. So all the elements of order p in G form into sets of p minus 1 sets. So the number of subgroups of order p is something that is minus 1 mod p divided by p minus 1. And you notice this is also minus 1 mod p. So this must be something that is 1 modulo p. So the number of subgroups of order p is always 1 plus um, a multiple of p, quite often just 1, of course. Um, in any case, the number of subgroups of order p is non-zero, so there must be elements of order p. OK, now we can go back to groups of order 10, or rather groups of order 2p. So suppose g is equal to 2p. Then um, we pick some element a of order p, b of order 2. And then look at the subgroup A, which is generated by A as a subgroup of order P, and it is index 2. So it is normal in G. And um, so we see that G is a semi direct product of A by B, where this is. This is a group Z modulo 2Z, and this is a group Z modulo PZ. So this is just like the case of groups of order 6. We now have to figure out all ways that a group of order 2 can act on a cyclic group of order P. Well, well the cyclic group of order P has an automorphism group Z over PZ star. And this is only two elements of order two. And the reason for this is that if P is a prime, then Z modulo PZ is a field under the usual addition and multiplication modulo P. Now, if you've got a field, a polynomial of degree n has at most n roots. So if we're trying to solve the equation x squared minus 1 is congruent to 0 mod p, it has at most two roots, and these roots are obviously plus 1 and minus 1, unless p equals 2, in which case there's only one root. So there are exactly two automorphisms of order 2 of z modulo pz, unless p is equal to 2, which is a kind of case we've already done. Um, by the way, you have to be a bit careful here because Z modulo NZ is not necessarily a field and may have more than two solutions of X squared equals two. For instance, Z over 8Z, we have X squared equals one if X is congruent to one, three, five, or seven mod eight. So, so Z modulo 8Z actually has four square roots of one, which is, causes endless problems. Um, Z modulo 8Z is, of course, not a field, and 8 isn't prime. So 
um, if something isn't a field, a polynomial of degree two can have more than two roots. Anyway, to get back to our group, um, we've got A is of order P, and it can be is acted on by Z over 2Z, which is our group B of order 2, and the action, um, um, th there are two possible actions. So A is generated by an element A with A to P equals 1, and B by an element of order 2. And we can either have the trivial action where B acts as the trivial automorphism of A, so B A B to the minus 1 equals a, and this implies that our group of order 2p is just a times b, which is z over pz times z over 2z, which is isomorphic to z over 2pz and is the cyclic group. On the other hand, we could have the non-trivial action, where b a b to the minus 1 is now a to the minus 1. So this gives us the um, um, dihedral group of order 2p. So the dihedral group is just the group of all symmetries of an n-sided polygon. So if we take n to be 5, just for definiteness, the um, dihedral group of order 2 times 5 has a rotation by um, one nth of a revolution. So this is the element A. And we can also reflect in some line through the diagonal. So the element B is going to be a reflection like this. And you can check that um, 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 have I got A and B the right way around? Yes. Um, B, A, B to the minus 1 is equal to A to the minus 1. So if, if we reflect and then rotate and then undo the reflection, we've actually rotated in the opposite direction. Um, so next lecture, I'll be saying a bit more about dihedral groups.